Welcome to the March 9th, 2022 meeting of the Oceanside City Council. I'd like to go ahead and call this meeting to order and begin with roll call. Mr. Mayor, Navarro? Mayor Sanchez. Present. Deputy Mayor Kime. Here. Councilmember Jensen. Here. Councilmember Rodriguez. Here. Councilmember Weiss. Here. Thank you. We're going to please stand. We're going to be doing the invocation tonight. We have of Father Charles Wright from the Prince of Peace Abbey. Good evening, Father Charles. Great to see you. Let us pray. Divine creator of all that we know and experience, we turn to you in this time of need for the strength the wisdom and the prudence that only you can supply. We ask your concern for all those who are in need, especially in Ukraine, and all others who are being threatened with violence. Assist those who struggle to survive and lead their lives of generosity and peace to which you have called them. We ask also for the courage and the wisdom in handling the affairs of this city, which is attracting so many new residents and an increasing number of tourists. We ask specifically for aid and understanding for those who are homeless and so many unable to lead lives with the dignity that you have intended them to have. We need not wait for Thanksgiving to offer you our gratitude for all the gifts you shower upon us and by them to call us to be of service, especially in city government, closest to those affected, so that the greatest good may be granted to the greatest number. We are grateful and we seek all these in your divine name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Father Charles. Please remain standing and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. Ready, begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. You may be seated. OK, we're first going to start off under presentations and proclamations with Pet of the Month. So Kelly, come on down and bring Bella with you. A very, very cute, I don't know, I don't pet, friend. So I'm gonna go ahead and hand the mic over to Kelly from the Humane Society. Thank you very much. Hello, council members and everybody. This is Bella, she's nine years young. She was surrendered to the San Diego Humane Society's Oceanside Campus on February 24th. Um, her owners had to, to surrender her because um, she had a scuffle with one of the other resident dogs and when they came to find her, her eye was really, really in bad shape and it needed to be removed and the owners could unfortunately not pay for it. So at that point, they had to make the hard decision to surrender to her to us. Um, so our medical department is amazing. They took care of her. She's healing up really, really well. And now she's available for adoption and waiting for a new home. She'd probably be best in a quiet household where there's maybe no other dogs, unless if they're very, very low energy and maybe don't bother her. She hasn't been exposed to cats. She did live with an 11-year-old, which she got along very um, well with. Um, but we do suggest that if there are kids in the home that you know, they're very gentle with her, um, so it would really depend on the kid. Just because, you know, she's nine, you know, we don't really want to be bothered as we get older. Um, also for the Humane Society, our Oceanside campus and all of our campuses are now closed on Mondays. Our operating hours are Tuesday through Sunday from 10 to 6. And um, we also have a lot of volunteer opportunities. We're also hiring at our Oceanside campus at a lot of different roles and also at our other campuses as well. And we have our Walk for Animals coming up. It's one of our huge events that we do every year and it's happening on May 7th at Liberty Station. So it's a great walk. You can walk, you can register to walk, you can just go for the event and check it out. It's a great time. And if anybody is looking to adopt, volunteer, donate, whatever you need, resources, just check out our website at sdhumane.org. Well, thank you, Kelly. Thank you, my dear. Thank you. And let's give little Bella a little, a little bit of a clap there. Thank you very thank much. Thank you so much. Bye, everyone. Thank you. OK, well, we have one proclamation 
that I get very, very excited about. We started this last year, but it was virtual. So this is National History of Women, right, month. And I am just so excited to honor eight organizations that are for and or about women um, and have done wonderful things in our community here in Oceanside. So um, please, I have, I have already handed out the, uh, the proclamations. Please com come on up and join me. We have the Women's Club of Oceanside. <laughs> with Doc Hensel and Maria Carrasco, both vice presidents. The president is, um, Rose Tedding is actually um, on vacation for her birthday, right? So, yes. We have the Seroptimus International of Oceanside Carlsbad with Denise Mueller Karenik, president. We have the League of Women Voters of North County, San Diego, Jennifer White, secretary. We have Jill Marshall, Women's Resource Center. This is like, you know, a, a team, right? It's like I wanted to go, ta, 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 you know, all the way down. Uh, we have the North County African American Women's Association, Linda Berry, President. Woo! We have Gabriela Hushman of Mana de North County, San Diego. Yes. We've got Jerry Nicholas of North County LGBTQ Resource Center. All right. And then we have Lisa Nava, president of North County Justice Allies. I'm gonna go ahead and first read off this wonderful, I think, I think it speaks to Oceanside and our residents on, on like the history, um, what great things uh, these organizations have been able to do. Um, for women, about women. And so we have National Women's History Month 2022. Whereas American women and girls of every race, class, and ethnic background have made historic contributions to the growth and strength of our country in countless recorded and unrecorded ways. And whereas American women have played and continue to play critical economic, cultural, and social roles in every sphere of the life of our country and in Oceanside, by constituting a significant portion of the labor force, working inside and outside of the home, as well as serving our country courageously in the military. And whereas American women have been political leaders, not only in securing their own rights of suffrage and equal opportunity, but also in the abolitionist movement, the emancipation movement, the industrial labor movement, the civil rights movement, the peace movement, and others, creating a more fair and just society for all. And whereas the Women's Club of Oceanside was formed on January 4th, 1918, here in Oceanside, joining the General Federation of Women's Clubs in 1920, dedicated to enhancing our local community through the arts, conservation, education, home life, and public affairs, providing scholarships to local high school seniors and nursing students, funding to high school music and art programs, the Oceanside Boys and Girls Club, Oceanside Police and Fire Departments and personnel, the Women's Resource Center, and countless other charities donating millions of volunteer hours and raising and donating over $8 million. And whereas Seroptimus International was founded in Oakland in 1921, establishing the Oceanside Carlsbad Club on March 29th, 1947. SIO is a global volunteer organization providing women and girls with access to education and training they need to achieve economic empowerment with a vision that women and girls have the resources and opportunities to reach their full potential and live their dreams. And whereas the League of Women Voters, <laughs> a nonpartisan organization was founded in 1920 after the United States Constitution was amended to grant women the right to vote. The roots of LWV, North San Diego County, date back to 1962 
expanding to include Oceanside in 1972, empowering our residents to shape better communities, building citizen participation in the democratic process, and engaging communities in promoting positive solutions to public policy issues through education and advocacy. And whereas, Women's Resource Center, in 1974, five local Oceanside women came together to address the need for a rape crisis center, establishing their dream of a women's resource center in partnership with the Chicano Federation after receiving a $45,000 grant from the county with a goal to end sexual violence. The demand for services and partnership with local police expanded WRC's programs to include a safe place for domestic violence and child abuse victims generating 17 to 18 underground locations where battered women and their children were sheltered in private homes of brave, committed community members. The WRC now runs a 23-unit transitional facility, the WRC thrift store, generating much-needed revenue and a domestic violence response team, reviving courage, empowering lives. And whereas the North County African American Women's Association was created in 1995, dedicated to providing a support network through education, health awareness, and life skills programs for women and girls to increase their self-sufficiency. NCAAWA has given out over $270,000 in scholarships and initiated a pilot program a pilot mentoring program at King Middle School in Oceanside, seeking to expand to other schools. NCAAWA's annual Gentleman's Gourmet fundraiser is legendary, bringing all people of North San Diego County together in support of women and girls. And whereas Mana, there she is, um, was founded in 1974 now in 21 U.S. cities with MANA, the North County San Diego, establishing in 2009. MANA's signature program is the Hermanitas Mentoring Program for Latina Teens. MANA's mission is to empower Latinas through leadership, development, community service, and advocacy. And whereas the North County LGBTQ Resource Center, Jerry, yes was established in Oceanside on December 8th, 2011, growing over the last 10 years, 11 years actually, to include partnerships, or 12 years, to include partnerships to prevent human trafficking, free mental health clinics, free AIDS testing, competency training for local businesses, school districts, police departments and hospitals, support groups of all ages, including military members, homeless programs for youth, transgender support groups and name change clinics, advocacy and social justice and community events like Pride by the Beach, the GSA Club Awards, and Transgender Day of Empowerment and Remembrance. And whereas the North County Justice Allies, Lisa, are focused on offering support and protection to the underrepresented and marginalized groups in our community, active in asserting freedom of speech and assembly with collective actions, including the Women's March of North San Diego County. And whereas on January 20th, 2021, United States Vice President Kamala Harris was sworn into office as the first woman, first African American, first Asian American to hold that office. And whereas despite these contributions to our country and to Oceanside, the role of American women in history has been consistently overlooked and undervalued in the literature, teaching, and study of American history. Now, therefore, be it resolved that I, Mayor Sanchez, on behalf of the city of Oceanside, do proclaim March 2022 as Women's History Month in the city of Oceanside and ask all residents to join us in celebrating women's history, achievements, and challenges with appropriate programs, ceremonies, and activities. This is... This is all happening here in Oceanside, has happened for, as you heard, decades. Um, it, is, it is just so wonderful to hear about this leadership that you don't really think about, um, you know, and, and, and for this month especially, we had the first meeting 
um, gathering at the women's re at the women's um, club of Oceanside this past Thursday, honoring women um, for Women's History Month, and we're going to continue and make it bigger next year. Yes. Is that right? Yes. So we have Doc here, who's going to speak a few words about the Women's Club of Oceanside. The Women's Club of Oceanside, the ladies who get right in there and get the job done. By golly, you know, he talked about art. For many years, they had a special award for the graduating senior, and they gave them $200. Well, it went up to $500, and that's the year that our student from the schools here in Oceanside. She entered her beautiful artwork, and she won not just here at our club. They went on to district. They went on to state. And they won at state, and she won a $500 scholarship. So we've got artists. We've got talkers. We've got workers. We've got people who really care about Oceanside. And if you're like that, come and join us. Yes. They are actually located in the Crown, House, Crown Heights neighborhood, um, and they are such a welcoming organization. So women out there, they meet the first Thursday of every month. So next. Okay. <laughs> um, Seroptimus International of Oceanside and Carlsbad. We are actually this, this month celebrating our 75th anniversary with our chapter here in Oceanside. Um, and we invest in the dreams of women and girls. And we do that through two signature programs. One is called the Live Your Dream, and the other one is the Live Your Dream Community Partner Awards. And actually, a third one is the Dream It Be It for young ladies. Um, the Community Partner Awards, um, we have several of our recipients up here. We have fundraised many years and helped support community programs. Uh, Mana de North County, we just had a presentation. Uh, we do meet twice a month at Enzo's Barbecue and we are always looking for wonderful women that are looking at making a difference in our community because we need all the help we can get. We have a lot of work yet to be done. Thank you very much. Hello, I'm a member of the League of Women Voters and a few men of North County, San Diego. Uh, there's a, also a San Diego City League and we are all part of the California League the U.S. League, as Esther said, was established over 100 years ago, which was the same time that women finally won the right to vote. Leagues encourage informed and active participation in all levels of government, local and national. League hopes to empower residents to build better communities, engage in making democracy work, and promote their communities to find positive solutions to public policy issues. The League's key role is to educate citizens on voting. Leagues inform voters on how to register and vote. They have pro-con events and publication of the ballot issues, candidate forums, and resources so citizens are informed voters. Oh, I forgot to say nonpartisan too. Oh, I'm also a member of the Oceanside unit of the League too. Uh, League members educate ourselves on many important issues. We also advocate on issues of civil rights, racial justice, economic inequities, just to name a few. The most important thing for all of us to do is vote. Are you next in the from the Women's Resource Center in Oceanside. Uh, the Women's Resource Center has been providing uh, shelter and supportive services for women uh, for over 45 years in Oceanside. And we've always had a great collaborative um, experience with uh, pretty much everybody here tonight. And I think that really says a lot for Oceanside and North County. It's a very collaborative community and that, um, that means a lot. And being part of this group means a lot too. Thank you. On behalf of the North County African American Women's Association, first, we are graciously, thank you, a big thank you, Mayor Sanchez and to City Council. We want to invite you again to our fabulous Gentlemen's Gourmet. We are planning it now. This helps 
two of our signature mentoring programs, Becoming a Global Citizen and the Global Ambassadors Program, which we serve the community with in the schools. It's an honor to be standing here, but I can't take all the credit. It's the credit, the credit goes to the people who are working every day hard in making a difference, because you know youngsters, our, our young society go through many changes. And so we're here to meet their needs. So we meet online, check out our website, come to see us. We welcome you with open arms. Thank you. Hi, um, everybody. Thank you for inviting us again. Um, I just want to say something. Um, one of the things I do full time, I'm the honor to say that I work for Oceanside Unified School District. Yeah. And I have my two vice principals. I work for El Camino High School. My two dear vice principals, they are my cheerleaders today. <laughs> and, uh, and my part time job, my volunteer job is Mana de Nocante San Diego. I'm one of the uh, co uh, founders of the organization since 2009. And it's exactly right to uh, empower young Latina girls from middle school and high school. So Optimus is one of the biggest supporters, uh, um, pregnancy resource centers with um, um, lost um, name or right now. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> a little uh, uh, nervous here, talking in front of everybody. Uh, nonetheless, so uh, one of the things I want for you to add, uh, Esther, is that we have been offering a scholarship for our seniors. So we have right now, oh, I have given uh, uh, our 43 scholarships for uh, 43 seniors that they have graduated from our program and hermanitas from Carlsbad and Oceanside. So that's something that's uh, important to add uh, because thanks to all these wonderful donors, you know, these other organizations, we're able to, to, to do this, to help our girls and to follow the girls to uh, college and to their careers and to the uh, uh, everyday life. So I just want to say that sí se puede. Thank you. Hi, uh, thank you for having us again, Mayor Sanchez and city council members. Uh, my name is Jerry Nicholas. My pronouns are she, her, hers. I'm an out and proud queer woman representing the AAPI community and the North County LGBTQ Resource Center founded by Max Disposti. Um, this year for International Women's Day, first I stand here because of another kupuna in my life, my Hawaiian tutu, Ruth Luka O'ili Ka'aiohua Nicholas Prince, for continu continuing to guide me. I'd like to acknowledge and celebrate all the badass moms, sisters, grandmas, and aunts that I've met these last two years during COVID that have called or brought their kids into our LGBTQ center seeking guidance and information for peer support groups, binder programs, but for also asking important questions about pronouns, HRT, name changes, and mental health. Also, let's not forget our transgender moms that continue to fight for equity, not just, not just in our own backyard, but in this country. Thank you to all the women that have stood next to us over the years that continue to use their voices in support for our LGBTQ community. And thank you for my own mom supporting and teaching me that love is love is love. Be kind to one another, and please join us also for Transgender Day Visibility. Um, our picnic is March 26th, and our Pride by the Beach Festival right here in Oceanside on June 11th. Thank you. My name is Lisa Nava, she, her, hers. I am the president of the North County Justice Allies, and I'd like to just leave you with a little bit of history that's happened in my lifetime. In 1971, women could not get a credit card. Women could not serve on the front lines with our service in military. They could get fired for being pregnant. They could not take legal action against the workplace for sexual harassment. These are just a few things that I have seen in my lifetime and the reason that I got involved with the Women's March years ago. I want to say to this assembly here, I am very honored by each and every one of you that have worked in your community uh, women work in the community every day with their families and their schools. And I'd like to say to everyone here, listen to women. Trust women. Women are ready to lead, and we're ready to lead right beside you. So celebrate Women's History Month. It's a great time to march on. If we could get closer together, and our council member, Christopher Rodriguez, would like to say a few words. Yes, um, 
our mayor Sanchez here has been celebrating all these amazing women and I think it's appropriate as a fellow proud Hispanic to uh, honor our mayor who happens to be the first uh, woman mayor and that really deserves a lot of honor. So thank you, Mayor Sanchez. And, uh, I want to make sure you're, you're celebrating. Thank you, Christopher. Thank you. Did you know in the middle? Oh, in the middle. Okay. Thank you. Here we go. Yes. Hide me. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. And don't forget, celebrate National Women's History Month. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, closed session report, Mr. Mullen. Thank you. There was no meeting on item one, uh, the labor item. Item two, public employee eva performance evaluation. Uh, there was discussion, no direction from the council, nothing to report on that item under the Brown Act. Um, that's all. Thank you. Now on to consent um, calendar items. That would be items four through 15 with number 16 being pulled by staff. Are there any requests to speak? There are no requests to speak on any of the consent calendar items. There's a motion by Councilmember Weiss, second by Councilmember Rodriguez um, for approval of the balance. I do want to state as to item number eight, um, which is uh, an amendment to an existing PSA that is an agreement with GHD of San Diego um, for $20,000 additional funds. There were two. Um, Subject matters here, one was for the SCOOP program, which of course we're dying to get um, um, completed, but is also if there's any leftover to continue with um, community outreach and public education efforts for, um, I, 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 I assume, the groins project. So um, it's yes to the first and no to the second if my vote could reflect that on item number 18. I mean, eight, excuse me, eight. Thank you, let's vote. Motion approved, 5-0, with the exception of item number eight, with Mayor Sanchez voting yes on the first part and no on the second part. Thank you. Um, we're gonna go over to uh, public communications on off agenda items. We do have an advance request to speak, um, which is by Bart, Mr. Bart Ziegler. Is Mr. Ziegler here in the room? Okay. I. I don't see anyone rising at this time, so we'll go ahead and begin. Um, we'll no, I'm going to do go to 19. Yes. Yes. Yeah. As soon as he gets here. Um, so, so, item number 19 are communications from the public regarding items not on this agenda. Um, the difference between the first one was that we had advanced requests to speak about a week before was a deadline if you wanted to actually state the, the, the subject matter that you wanted to speak on. So for item number 19, uh, Mr. Navarro, did you want to go ahead and get started here? Sure. Uh, we do have eight speakers under item number 19. Our first speaker is Sia Osi Liua, to be followed by Manuel Camargo, to be followed by Crystal Jabara. Good evening, uh, Mayor and the rest of the gentlemen and audience. I have a simple subject here. Let me read my letters. Uh, my name is Seosi Palusami Liua. That's an uncivilized name. And I am writing this letter to explain to you that as a recent transplant from Oceanside to Oceanside from San, San Joaquin, Valley for the past year. I have found Thomas Street where I live for the past year is a very dangerous zone. Thomas Street is the only street connection to Emerald Street to Thunder. Drive with only one stop sign, which is not effective and allow people to constantly speed to 50 to 70 miles an hour. And that's no lie. 
causing safety con con congestion and concern. The poster speed limit is 25 miles per hour, and a constant speed limit make it dangerous for residents to walk and access parking. parking. It is requested that the city of Oceanside install speed bump or other suitable control to eliminate this hazard as soon as possible before a serious accident occurs. Additionally, Amherst Street between Olive Street and 78 has seen speed in excess of 50 miles as opposed to 35 miles per hour, resulting in numerous accidents, including one recent fatality, all caused by speeding and needed to be addressed. Both of these concerns must be addressed before accident and loss of life happening. I am a retired United States Air Force tech sergeant, also a retired U.S. mailman. My wife is a retired school teacher, and I'm also a, a member of the American Legion here in Oceanside. I used to be the commander of American Legion up north for 15 years. We serve veterans or anybody. We, matter of fact, here is uh, our organization over here. We feed poor people. Including me, I'm poor, <laughs> I'm not rich. So uh, that's my subject. And I hope, uh, like I say, anyway, I'm moving out of here, I'm selling my home. I'm moving to San Diego. But I'm doing this for the good of people that come before me, after me, that's all. Thank you very much for your cooperation and uh, God bless you all. Thank you. Ms. Lorsa, could you have one of staff speak to him, perhaps get a contact for, for that neighborhood. Manuel Camargo, to be followed by Crystal Jabara, to be followed by Dwight H. Benner. Good evening, Mayor and members of the council. Uh, my name is Manuel Camargo, and I'm here with SCE and Songs. We appreciate that Oceanside is as an appointee to the Songs Community Engagement Panel since it was formed back in 2014. Tonight I'm here to speak under item 19, albeit related to the, uh, some of the material in the re resolution in item 18, um, and it's related to Songs. So uh, due to time constraints, I just want to point out a few of the inaccuracies in that item. Uh, starting with the cover email, uh, a 50-mile NRC emergency evacuation zone has never existed. Uh, we previously had a 10-mile emergency planning zone, but even that is no longer required by the NRC due to the reduction in risk uh, with the reactors at Songs permanently re retired and the spent fuel in passive dry storage. Second, the spent fuel is in a solid state, not liquid, so even with a hypothesized through-wall crack of a canister, there is no threat at an, of an emergency leak, the fuel cannot cause an explosion, and nothing is going to disable the neighboring highway. Canisters do not have a um, shelf life of 25 years, but rather, per the NRC, 100 years or more. Uh, moving on to the proposed resolution, there are some uh, additional errors of fact. With respect to the assertion that there is considerable dispute among experts about the suitability of the utilities repair method, I would point out that an independent specialty consultant retained by the California Coastal Commission reviewed our metallic overlay repair method. That method accelerates nickel to supersonic speeds to form a metallurgical bond with the canister shell. The Coastal Commission approved the method as part of a canister health maintenance program. Metallic overlay is a scientifically validated repair method and it is now on the shelf and available if ever it were needed. Also the assertion that the spent fuel could prompt a $13.4 billion in damages sounds scary but has no basis in fact. Uh, with all the spent fuel and passive dry cast storage per the NRC, there are zero incidents that would result in an off-site release of radiation. Now I agree with the last point in the resolution, and that is supporting, uh, supporting congressional uh, efforts to open a permanent national repository for the disposal of the spent fuel. SCE has taken significant action here. We developed a strategic plan to explore the off-site re relocation of the spent fuel. We helped to form a broad-based coalition to advocate for solutions, and uh, just recently we hosted a senior official from the Department of Energy at a community engagement panel meeting to address the department's renewed work on this federal spent fuel management program. So we have a real op window of opportunity here. We need to work together with other like-minded stakeholders, hopefully including Oceanside, to effectively navigate that window. 
Let me close by inviting the uh, city council members and staff to do your own homework here. We would also invite you all to come visit the plant and see it for yourself. And with that, I thank you for your attention. Thank you. Crystal Jabara, to be followed by Dwight H. Benner, to be followed by Shelley. Good evening, Honorable Mayor, Council, and City staff. My name is Crystal Jabara. I'm here on behalf of Supervisor Jim Desmond, your county supervisor here in District 5. Uh, he is also the co-chair of the Action for Spent Fuel Solutions Now Coalition, um, which, is, which was formed last year to encourage the federal government to provide off-site storage or permanent disposal solutions for the spent fuel, fuel at songs and other nuclear sites across the, the state and the nation. The Board of Supervisors unanimously voted to join the coalition in August of 2021, and since then we have built a bipartisan group of more than 200 members. Our neighbors, including Orange, Riverside counties, the city of La Mesa, San Clemente, Dana Point, Newport Beach, and Riverside, state legislators, local chambers, and business organizations, including the Oceanside Chamber of Commerce, labor and environmental groups, Native American leaders, and utilities, among many more. While Songs was retired in 2013 and decommissioning work is currently underway, as you've already heard, the spent fuel must be removed from our coastline to complete the decommissioning process. Once the decommissioning is complete, the land can be restored and returned to the Department of Defense. Federal leg legislation requiring the government to begin disposal of spent fuel in 1998. More than two decades later, we are still waiting for them to meet this requirement. The good news is that there appears to be an unprecedented window of opportunity opening on the federal level. Last week, the coalition submitted a response to the Department of Energy's request for information on a consent-based siting process for federal spent fuel storage. In other recent development, Congressman Mike Levin announced, that, announced the formation of a bipartisan spent nuclear fuel solutions caucus along with Congressman Rodney, Rodney Davis of Illinois. Supervisor Desmond is also a member of Congressman Levin's Songs Task Force. With bipartisan support from across the region, the coalition is poised to play a meaningful role in discussion regarding the restart of federal spent fuel management program and the removal of spent fuel from our coastline. These developments present a unique opportunity for local stakeholders, including the city of Oceanside, to speak with a unified voice. We believe joining the Action for Spent Fuel Solutions now is the best way for the City of Oceanside to support our efforts. We request that the City of Oceanside consider joining the coalition. We can work together to advocate for solutions and ensure songs decommissioning can be completed and the site restored. I have emailed the entire council an update of the coalition and a link to their site, the resolution passed by the Board of Supervisors, and a sample resolution passed by other cities. I appreciate your time today, and I'm here to answer any questions either tonight or in the future if you need them. Wow, three minutes. Thank you. Thank you. Right on time. <laughs> uh, Dwight H. Benner, to be followed by Shelley, to be followed by Sandy Beal. Good evening. Mayor Sanchez, members of the City Council, and the City of Oceanside staff. My name is Dwight H. Benner, and I'm a resident at the Rancho Santa Luis Rey Mobile Home Park, and I'm also a Homeowners Advisory Committee officer. And recently, Mayor Sanchez honored me at my retirement after 42 years in public service with the County of Riverside. I am here to request that you, as our city leaders, look into the way that our annual health and safety inspection is done for mobile homes. The City of Oceanside Code Enforcement Department handled their inspection this year at Rancho San Luis Rey Mobile Home Park, and I was appalled. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, pardon me. Olga Lugan who was the, count, was the city of Oceanside's representative, was there less than 35 minutes. We're the largest mobile home park in Oceanside. You know, if on a regular day, if I wasn't appalled,
called, I'd actually, it would be admirable that she was able to do this. Unfortunately, it was a rush job. This solidifies that the disabled, blind, and aged communities are not a priority in our city, in our seaside city. We have, like I said, we have 433 mobile homes. I understand that the annual health and safety inspection has been separated into two areas. One is completed by your code enforcement office and the other is completed by the fire department. I have to ask whose brilliant idea was this? Did anyone think that both departments should be involved at the same time to complete a cohesive inspection? I don't know, maybe a work schedule or a schedule out between the two parties can be present and work together to come to a unified decision on whether to raise our rents or not. Was this something that was discussed? I suggest that in the future that all parties be present during the yearly health and safety inspe inspection, especially in a 55 and older community. My last thought is, may I suggest that you as our leaders make the disabled, blind, and aged population, which, have in, which includes our veteran population, a priority in our city. As of right now, I do not see that as a priority. This shows with the fact that you shut down public comment in via Zoom. Disabled, blind, and aged people that are housed or are in their home or bed bound are not able to participate in these meetings. Mr. Benner, could you complete your comments? Senior Lives Matter. Thank you. Shelley, to be followed by Sandy Beal, to be followed by Christina Beal. Good evening. You guys know me. I actually have a last name. It's Parker. I uh, also live in Rancho San Luis Rey, and I'm speaking for myself. Uh, I'm going to talk about the letter that we got for our annual park registration fee that is to be passed on uh, supposedly 50% to the residents, which whether I like it or not, is in the 16B, but the letter we got, they have actually charged us for more than 50%. So I will be, I guess, filing a complaint with um, code enforcement and with Christopher since he raised his hand. It is not a lot of money, but we are for facing a large CPI because everybody knows that, you know, the price of gas is $5.50 or more and everything has gone up. And so a few dollars per household makes a difference. And star management yet again has stepped over the line. And so I'm here to say that. And I also, in reading 16B, it does seem as though there is the, this money is paid into a specific fund. And I actually would like to, I guess, go for public record to see how much money is in that fund and what it has been spent on. I know the city council can do it, but I think that the people who are actually paying into the fund should get uh, the ability to take a look at it. Yes, no? Uh, I'll file with the city clerk and find out about it. Okay, great, Zeb, because as a, a corporate finance person, I'd like to review that um, because as Dwight said, 35 minutes spent couldn't actually be the $67,000 that uh, you guys are getting from our one park alone this year. And so uh, I'll be reviewing that. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Parker, and I believe the, I believe the department would be the um, uh, neighborhood services. Neighborhood services. Yes. Okay. So that you. would be Ms. Uh, Lilani Hines. Okay. Um, they oversee uh, this this the um, 16B, uh -huh. um, but also I believe that the uh, the fees are are to cover the cost of the inspections as well as any hearings that may. Uh, yeah, result. The, yeah, the administration so, of it, but yeah. 
you know, 10 okay. years, if you think about it, there's more than 2,000 homes. Right. There's Ms. Hines will explain all that to you, though. Okay. And, Mayor, she so should much. file with the uh, city clerk's office. And we have already produced these documents in prior PRA, so they should be readily available to okay. provide Great. to you. Thank you, Ms. Paul. Yeah. The complaint will be through the city clerk's office. Oh, okay. Okay. Public Records um, Act re request is through the uh, city clerk's office. And then if, if she wants to file a complaint, would that be through Neighborhood Services? Just, just email me. I got you. Okay. Yeah, there, there might be timeline. So I just want to make sure she emails you both. Okay. Email, email both. Thanks. Um, next, Sandy. Go ahead. Um, Honorable Mayor Sanchez and City Council members, I'm Sandy Beal from Rancho San Luis Rey Mobile Home Park, Park Representative. I want to read you a few emails between me and Olga Lugan, the person that inspected RSLR this year and also in 2020 and 2021. Hi, Sandy. We have an inspection set for Thursday, March 3 at 1.30. I do, not, I do have another inspection at 2.30 p.m., so the inspection should not take more than 45 minutes. Thank you. Olga. Hi, Olga. Okay, I'll be there. I honestly don't think 45 minutes is enough time to look at a park as big as Rancho San Luis Rey. It seems like we should at least get the same amount of time as every other park, which you said was one hour. Sandy. Hi, Sandy. I drive by 15 minutes before meeting you and the, manage, and the manager to check the park. So no worries, there will be an hour. Olga. Sandy. I am only looking at the common buildings and will be driving through beforehand to check off some of the items. Thank you, Olga. In the past, this is not what our health and safety inspection was. Only the two clubhouses, restrooms, and laundry rooms were looked at. Ms. Lugan was actually about 10 minutes late, so, Ra so Rancho Lan San Luis Rey only got a 35-minute inspection. Rancho San Luis Rey deserves fair, a fair health and safety inspection. Thank you for allowing me to speak. Thank you. Christina Beal, to be followed by Jimmy Knott, to be followed by Rosie Higuera. Hi, I'm also from Rancho San Luis Rey Mobile Home Park. My name's Christina Beal. And I did send an email to the city clerk today at about 2.30, so hopefully you have that in your packet. And I won't address all of that. The only thing I really wanna get on here is about the um, inspection report that Sandy just referred to. On the rent, um, control inspection report form, there are, I forget how many questions or um, items to be addressed, one of which is the park and building lighting. It is my understanding that the lighting was not addressed this year at all, especially after dark. And yet the inspection report approved the rent uh, increase. Our lighting is probably was probably built to code in 1971. Um, this is what 50 years later. <laughs> it's not adequate. I asked um, and uh, received a letter from Officer Cobian of the um, Oceanside Police Department. He sent a letter to Sarah Chase at Star Management and uh, recommended better lighting for our park for health and safety issues. We have a lot of homeless people wandering in our park, especially the phase one, um, some uh, minor robbery things. I don't know what the right term for that is. Anyway, I think it's, um, I don't know how an inspection or a rent control increase can be allowed without a full inspection of the property, which, um, as Sandy said, 35 minutes is not enough for 433 homes. You've got to walk around the park, and somebody has to come in at night and look at our lighting. It's, it's just not safe. 
I think that's all I had. Thank you. Thank you. Mayor, council members, Jimmy Knott, 127 Sherry Lane. I am the homeowner's representative at La Salina Mobile Village. And we had our inspection as well. And this brought up with the uh, previous speakers an issue as well. We had uh, the inspection, but I was sent the notice for lamp lighter. And that was three days before the inspection. Now, that's not enough time to really notify the homeowners within my park. And then when I contacted the city, I was given the notice of a telephone call the day before the inspection. Oh, you're going to have your inspection 2 o'clock the next day. So my people were not allowed to take and have input to their representatives to share with the inspector. And then on the day of the inspection, we were going through the park, and uh, Olga was there with her trainee, and it started to rain. Well, guess what? End of inspection. Away she goes. Uh, so that gives you an idea on it, and it was about 28, 29 minutes at the most. So about one third of our park was not covered. But also, I have to agree with the gentleman that spoke earlier too, uh, Mr. Warner, um, Burner. And uh, the thing is, is that we have a problem here in Oceanside. We have a gas increase for our fuel that's going on. That's going nationwide. It's going to affect everything. And what's happening is, you have put a blockade against our seniors who are having input into your meeting. You could easily make sure that there is allowance saying you get it in by a certain time, you get your communication in, put the restriction like that or something. But you are putting that roadblock to freedom of speech and freedom of input to their representatives. Please correct that, because what's going to take place is the money that's coming into their retirements is being eaten up. Where are they going to get the money to get here? It's costing an arm and a leg, and for people on limited incomes, especially our retired seniors, your roadblock is going to be a stumbling block. Please rethink it. Thank you. J Jimmy, was your um, inspection because of the rain, was it rescheduled? Just a question. Uh, no, it wasn't. In fact, uh, Olga contacted me and said that uh, she will take and get the results of the inspection probably about mid-March. Uh, Thank you. Rosie Higuera? Rosie? Higuera? Higuera? This, this is, a, this is a request to speak on items not on the agenda. Did you submit a, a, a slip? I'll ask again after our six o'clock. We have one t um, certain. Um, I, I wanted to ask. T t uh, we're done then. Oh, we're, if, if Rosie sorry. is Rosie not Iguera, here. are you present? Okay. Thank you very much. Um, I want to again call out Mr. Bart Ziegler. Mr. Ziegler. Oh, you're here. No. Um, okay. So yes. Why don't we go ahead and get you. Put, turn in a slip afterwards, Ms. Uh, yeah, go ahead, since we have a few more minutes before 6 o'clock. If, if you um, state your name and then you have up to three minutes to speak on items not on the agenda. Right. Right. And then submit your slip afterwards. Oh, okay. Thank you. 
Um, Patty Kirschwam and um, Oceanside resident. I just wanted to remind you all, Mayor and the council members, that you did, you do, you did have an invite in your inbox um, to the documentary for March 14th. It's really critical, and anyone watching at, from home now, it's a uh, documentary, Whose Children Are They? And it's a really good insight for all of you, all of us, on what's going on in the public school system. That's 7 o'clock, Monday night, the 14th, at the Regal Cinema. Please come down and join us. You will learn a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Call again, Mr. Bart Ziegler. Okay, so we'll go ahead and take a three minute break. Okay, we're gonna go ahead and uh, resume our council meeting here. We're now at uh, time certain items, which are our public hearing items. We have one, and that is item number 17 which is uh, to um, receive public feedback regarding the boundaries of redrawn city council districts and introduction of an ordinance to adopt the final version of the redistricted city council district map. I'm gonna go ahead and um, open this public hearing and request disclosures from um, council members regarding constituent contacts and correspondence. Staff, the public, this is the sixth time we're hearing this. So. S staff in the public. Staff in public. Staff public. Thank you. Uh, uh, Mr. Navarro, do we have any correspondence and or petitions? All correspondence on this item was uh, delivered to council prior to the meeting. Okay, thank you. So we're going to go ahead and begin testimony with you, Mr. Navarro, as our city clerk. All right, thank you. Uh, this is our final public hearing regarding the redistricting process. It's uh, been quite a very robust process with community outreach meetings and our public hearings, as well as meeting different members of the public uh, to help them with their maps. At the last city council meeting, the council chose draft map C for the final map for the redistricting process. That is the map that is currently up on the monitor right now. And the action tonight that we are recommending is that uh, the council listens to any last minute feedback from the public and receive that input and to finalize the draft map for the um, permanent map for the redistricting process. Thank you, and I understand that the uh, demographer is on call by phone yeah. for any questions that the council members would like to ask and or public. That is All correct. Right. So um, this is uh, a public hearing. This is the time for the public um, to speak on this item. And again, it's this is a redistricting. You do not have to have filed a request to speak previously. Um, do we have any people who have filed a request to speak? We, we have three individuals that have uh, filed a request to speak. Um, Shelly Parker, to be followed by Jimmy Knott, to be followed by Amanda Bergara. Thank you, so after those three, I will again um, ask if there are, are any, um, um, anyone who would like to speak on this item, regardless of you not having submitted a slip. Thank you, Shelley. Yes, good evening, and let me say, Honorable Mayor and City Council, I forgot that originally. Um, I, in looking at the map, I can't quite see, but I would hope that my community of interest is mobile home parks, and I hope that they have been kept together in, uh, we are in District 2, and we hope that that has remained that way since we yes. actually, since we're as much as possible, are covered under 16B, mostly seniors, and we have specific issues that make us a community of interest. So I would hope, I did go to meetings, I would hope that that has been uh, kept intact. We were 0.39 from changing, so I hope everybody else got moved and we didn't. Thank you. Well, your wish so far has uh, been granted. Uh, I don't believe there have been any changes to District 2. Mr. Knott. Mayor, Council Members, Jimmy Knott, 127, Sherry Lane. I have a few items uh, here to go over. First off, I submitted a map of watersheds that I thought would be considered. It was not presented to you. 
I had no response. I took and requested uh, basically a population study onto it uh, to the clerk's office in an email that was not responded to. And the map online uh, for this, this item tonight uh, was not able to focus in on the proposed new lines. I mean, if you tr focused in on it, you basically got a blur. So I don't know where my park stands or where Cavalier stands. And so if it's on one side, if they're using Loma Alta Creek, Cavalier will be divided in two. It, it, um, has, it has remained intact. Um, it's in three. Pardon? And uh, so also, it, with the dividing lines of the new districts, have the homeowners, the voters, the residents been notified of their districts having been changed? This should be an open process. If there is a change, they should be notified and have an opportunity to take and come to the council and say their opinions instead of having it done this way. Um, now, the other thing is, is that there's problems also uh, potentially with bifurcating established communities. Like my park, I don't know if it is or isn't because of the way the map was portrayed and is shifted potentially out of District 3. No. It isn't? No, no it's, it, it's, it's I remained. I tell because I couldn't focus in on the map. Okay. And I, I, I think there, several of us sounds like we have actually looked at your census block. It has to be the entire census block, and ha it has remained in District 3. Good, because the thing is, I have my concerns up, like I said. When I couldn't focus in, I just saw a blur, or I was sitting there, huh? And um, so I don't want to see any of the communities, uh, basically. Then the, then the final thing is that the final concern uh, for District 3 is the prop property of the La Salina Wastewater Treatment Plant. That is a concern uh, for South Oceanside. We want it to be part of a park down in our neighborhood. Thank you. With respect to your question, is it in District 3 because this is a redistricting hearing? Mm -hmm. Yes, it is still in District 3. The, the wastewater treatment plant? Yes. We hopefully uh, see it. <laughs> Amanda Bergara? We'll be able to we'll be able to have the map uh, go into detail. Correct. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. There's a request from Mr. Knott to make sure that those items are in okay. District Three. And and we made a note of that as well. Okay. Good. Yeah. Next. Hi, I'm Amanda Bergara, and thank you for the opportunity to speak. Um, Peter Weiss, uh, you said a little while ago that this was the sixth time that the redistricting had been discussed here, but this was the first time that I had heard about it. And I do follow the city on social media, so I just wanted to mention that. But um, I looked at the map and I really couldn't tell much of anything um, that had changed because it doesn't really say what has changed. So I have a one question, two parts. Um, the first part is what specifically has changed in the in the redistricting, and I ask that for all the districts of Oceanside. I am an Oceanside resident um, of District 1, but I ask that on behalf of all the districts. And the second part, how will the representatives of the districts this time be selected specifically for District 1, given the what happened with the last selection of the District 1 representative and the controversy surrounding that. Uh, did you have anything else to say? That's it. So District 1 is one of the elections that we will be having this November. Also District 2 will be this November. Okay, and what has changed? 
from the districting before and the new redistricting of the various districts? So we will answer that. The demographer is on call, right? She'll be able to answer that and hopefully show it on the map in, in greater detail. District 1 um, was the one district that needed more people because it was uh, above and beyond the, the 5%. five um, so there had to be more people added to District 1. So that is the main change between the one that the map that we have now and the one that is on on the uh, on the screen here. Okay, and and just like I said, I couldn't tell from the new map what had changed at all. Like that wasn't helpful. Um, and then okay, so now I have another question. Um, you still have time. Go is ahead. the census being taken into account with the District One election and? Given that Latino is the primary body of people in District 1, is anything being done about that? Or will that all depend on who steps up to run for representative of District 1? Or how will that work? So uh, your question, um, the difference between the populations, including Latino population for District 1. I'm speaking specifically about District 1. So the census right. has shown that we are the and and, and I live in District 1. Of representation. So um, the Latino um, population, voting age, um, and total population is not very different between the existing map and the one that is being proposed, um, which is map C that you see up here. But they'll show you. The, the city clerk's office is going to show. When? Tonight? Tonight, yes. Oh, okay. Tonight. Thank you. Sorry, I should have said that. Tonight we're going to be looking at this in detail <laughs> together. <laughs> okay, um, those are where the, requ the specific requests to speak. If there are, any, are there any, does anybody else wish to speak, um, even though you did not submit a f uh, form? Come on up, give your name, please, and you've got up to three minutes. And if other people want to speak, please do start lining up uh, so we could uh, hear you. About the districts. About, about the, district. the districts. Yeah. Yeah. Honorable Mayor and City Council, my name is Renata Engel, and um, I'm a resident of Cavalier Mobile Estates. And I think you may have addressed some of my concerns, but I just wanted to bring forward, um, similar to what Jimmy was talking about, that. I think it is really important to keep the mobile home communities together, um, as specifically in District 3. I've talked to people that I know in La Salina and Cavalier, Cavalier, and also Pacific Trailer Park, and I think that's a smaller community, but it's still part of the South Oak community. And so those people, and they were not able to be here tonight, but they also had concerns that, um, and, and I have the same issue that everybody seems to have had as we pulled the maps up, we looked at them really closely. It's so hard to tell where some of those communities lie, but I think it's really important that Pacific Trailer Park be also included with um, our mobile home community and not split off into District 1, and I couldn't tell whether that had happened or not. Or Cavalier, for that matter, but it sounds like Cavalier and La Salina are both remaining in District 3. Yes, they're both in the same census block. The one rule that is uh, very critical is that you cannot divide a census block. So uh, Cavalier and um, um, La Salina are both in the same census block. They overlap. There is some, uh, some of the mobile home park, I think Cavalier is in another um, census block, but it's all kept, been kept together under this map. Okay, and, and as for Pacific? Pacific, I, I can't answer. I'm going to ask the city clerk's office to address that. I believe Pacific was moved into District 1 because the border lines were moved from Oceanside Boulevard to the railroad tracks, and that included a portion of Godfrey Street, the uh, cemetery area, and that kind of moved anything north of the railroad tracks into District 1 to make up for that standard deviation. And that was a census block we couldn't block we can uh, separate from the other neighborhoods in that area. That was a new one that was created, right? The, the one that kind of stuck through, stuck. Yeah, and that's kind of like okay. a little sliver that you see right there at right. the south part of District 1. 
And the same thing with um, the northern part, that huge giant peninsula. Um, that was just, a, that's actually a giant census block up there that we couldn't split. And we have to make sure that the census blocks are kept together. Okay, right. so Pacific then would be moved into District 1 and Cavalier and La Salina would maintain together even though yes. those three parks are very closely aligned as far as community goes. That is correct. Yeah. All right, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to address the council on redistricting, please come up to the podium and speak for up to three minutes, giving your name. My name is Diane Hansen. I live in Rancho San Luis Rey. I'm now president of OMA, which is for the 14 to 17 parks in Oceanside. Uh, we're concerned about um, uh, Miramar, I mean, West, what's it, Marina. Mission View Manor is kind of stuck off to the side all by itself. And it's just across the street from Douglas, which is the borderline. We'd like them included in District 2. So that's um, uh, Mission View and Mission View and um, Mission View West, right? Or Manor? Yes, Mission View West is in, in Mission in two, District 2. We want Mission View Manor also in District 2. Okay, Mission View Manor. Somehow it's got to be another four, question. And it's only across the street. Okay, so that will be um, that will be looked at. Yeah. Okay. And we do have our demographer on the line. Okay. So, are we going to be able to bring the map up and and also uh, look at the details? Are we going to be able to do that. Can we can we pull her up on laptop three? She can share a screen. <laughs> Anyone else see. wishing to speak before we close the cl um, the public comment period here? Anyone else wishing to speak on the redistricting item, item number seventeen? I see no one else rising. I'm going to go ahead and close this part of the public hearing. And I believe we do have the demographer uh, on, on, on call by, by Zoom. Okay. Yes, um, I am here. Good evening. Yeah. She is here, but unfortunately, she can't share her screen on this presentation. But we, we do have the assistant city clerk could zoom in on, on the map that was presented okay. before you. So if you would, um, Thomas, mm -hmm. um, go through the questions that were raised with respect to, I believe it's, it began with um, Mr. Knott's questions about the La Salina, uh, La Salina and Cavalier, as well as the La Salina treatment plant. So I am going to zoom in on the screen right here. So, sorry, really quick. And this map is, sorry, this map is available online for anybody to review, and you can zoom in at home. The La Salina is in this area, the treatment plant. And then the second part was Cavalier, which is located. Right there on Oceanside right Boulevard. Yes. Along Oceanside Boulevard. So hopefully that answers your question, Mr. Mr. Knott. So the La Salina Mobile Home Park, as well as Cavalier, Will, will remain in District 3. Uh, that little finger of District 1 you see encroaching into District 3, that is a census block that we must maintain, and we can't break up that census block. So unfortunately, uh, Pacific Park um, will have to be in District 1. And that was to make up for the deviation in District 1 and to increase the right. population there in there. There is another mobile home park in District 1. Yeah. That's... Um, um, Miramar. Yeah. Miramar? Miramar. Yeah. Yeah. And then the maps on the watershed were shared with council during the redistricting process and were entered into the record during the community outreach meetings. And we had four uh, in each district. One, one per district, but we had four in total. Could you respond to the other questions that were raised by the... 
The changes in District 1, um, again, District 1, and then we also have Jane on the line. So Jane, feel free to jump in and correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, but there was a negative 8% deviation that we needed to correct in District 1. We needed to bring that up to either negative 5% or, or greater than zero, um, or greater than five, negative 5%. So th District 1 did expand. Uh, the first expansion, as you see there, on the screen is the uh, that census block that dips into District uh, 3. That will become District 1. And then on the, the eastern portion. Are you, are you able to use the mouse to circle? Yeah. Just kind of point yeah. Like an area. Yeah. There we go. Yeah, and then the Rancho Del Oro area right there where El Camino High is, Thomas, if you could zoom in there. Yes, previously it went to uh, to El Camino. Uh, uh, it, previously it, the boundary was on uh, Rancho Del Oro and now oh, it yeah, is on right. Ivy Ranch Road. Yeah, so it moves from Rancho Del Oro to Ivy Ranch Road. Uh, so that area will now, if Thomas, if you could circle around that area there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this... Right. This huge square there where El Camino High is and that neighborhood surrounding it, all the way up to, I believe, Ivy Ranch Road is now going to be in District 1. Um, and then if we go to the northern portion of District 1, uh, right there, um, that the neighborhood of River Tree Drive was separated. One half was in District 1, the other one was in District 2. So your neighbor across the street was voting for a different council member than you were. And the biggest complaint we heard from that neighborhood was we all wanna be in the same district. So in order to do that, we had to include a census block, which is that big giant peninsula that you see there. So anybody that lives within that big giant peninsula, it's mostly wildlife and, and coyotes. Right, there's hardly anyone yeah. that actually There's hardly anybody in there. there. Um, is the new addition to District 1, and that is to make sure that River, the neighborhood of River Tree Drive is all within one district rather than your neighbor being in a different district. Um, as far as, um, I was trying to write down all the questions, as far as how our uh, council members are elected, um, District 1 will have an election this year. District 2 will also have an election this year. In 2024, the elections will be District 3, District 4, Mayor, City Clerk, and City Treasurer. Um, to run for District 1 or District 2, you would need to file um, a 501 form with the City Clerk's office, my office, and there's a whole bunch of other stuff you need to do. Um, you need to qualify for the ballot, you need to be 18 and over, registered to vote, and you need to get signatures to qualify for the ballot. And whoever gets qualified for the ballot will be on the ballot and it's up for the public to vote on that individual. But only those districts that have a council member up for an election will vote. So in this election, District 3 and District 4 will not be voting for their council members. They'll wait till, this, till 2024. Um, I'm not sure about all the, all the other the questions. Demographics, the demographics. The dem demographics of existing District 1 and the proposed MAP C. Yeah. No, no. No. Could you please come to the podium? I'm going to go ahead and recognize you at this point just because right. You're this responding is a very to my process. question. So mm -hmm. I'm sorry for just standing up, but um, so just to get clarification on the candidacy for District for the districts um, for people to run, will it be a requirement to live in that district? Yes. Yes. It is. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Okay. And and you also mentioned, um, Mr. Navarro, that there's a deviation between negative and eight. You had to get it to negative five. Mm -hmm. What did that? What does that mean? Um, our it's, our demographer will probably be more qualified uh, to answer that. But yeah, I can jump yeah. in if you would like. Yes. Um, Thanks, so, Jane. Yeah. Thanks for that question. Uh, so basically the first criterion when we're looking at redistricting is to make sure that the population of all the districts are roughly even. And that comes from the US Constitution, one person, one vote. You don't want one district that's super large and one that's very small. So we gotta balance those populations after the 2020 census. And generally um, 
what we do is we do an analysis on the current districts and we found out that your current district one is about 8% under the ideal population. So it's kind of small compared to the other ones. Um, and so through redistricting, we want to get all of the districts to be within plus or minus 5% of the population um, so that they're you know closer in size. And so that's what we did with district one in this map now being at minus 0.11% below the ideal population. So very close to perfectly balanced. Thank you. Thank you. About and the there demographics. was a question about the demographics, Jane. The Latino, uh, the population, uh, total population, I think she was asking about, as well as the um, uh, voting age, adult. I, I was just trying to make sure that um, because of the census that just came out and given the balance of the makeup of the population of District 1, that District 1 was going to keep its representation. Right. With these changes, that that was my main concern. Right, and and the whole basis for this, for doing redistricting every ten years, is because of the census. Um, so this is all based on the new census. And I believe we do have demographic data available on the clerk's website. So the yes. balance of the Latino and Black populations in District One will remain the same as. Before let's let's have our yeah. demog demographer. She has that information. You can you can go ahead and and, be and I believe our assistant city clerk. <laughs> yeah. Honorable Mayor and members of the city council, uh, Thomas Schmitter, assistant city clerk. Our redistricting webpage has all this information along with all the recordings of the meetings that have occurred on the webpage um, since our last uh, since our prior meeting. We've had the demographics for each potential map up. Um, I'm going to have it up online for review. Anyone could go there, click this link, and see the demographics for each potential map. Uh, we've selected map C, um, so the dem demographics are up for that map. Right, show the demographics if yeah. you would. So this table um, breaks down the three potential draft maps that we reviewed at the last meeting. Um, and the one that we are considering is draft map C. So it breaks down by district, the population um, for Latino, black, Asian, and white. We can't see that. Can you see that? Move, move it just a little bit. Oh, so um, for draft maps, the there we go. For District One, for Latino, we have thirty-one point three one. Um, for District Two, thirty-two point one eight. For Three, it is twenty-two point six six, and for District Four, it is twenty-five point nine one percent. For Black in District One, it's seven point three five percent. Uh, for District 2, that's 6.69. For District 3, that's 1.98. And for District 4, that is 6.29. Uh, Jane, do you have the, uh, demogra the current demographic information for each district as it is now? Uh, yes, I do. I'm sorry. My no I'm just getting that pulled up. If you could just give me one more minute. Thanks. Mayor, after this, I'm going to call for a point of order. Okay. I'm sorry, I do not want to um, have everyone wait. So just give me. Uh, let me let me follow up with this speaker after the uh, after and, the meeting or, or at a later point in the meeting. But I just want to note that the uh, the demographics of District One are not significantly different than their current uh, ones. But I'll give you that exact number in a moment. Thanks. And, and if anybody requires additional information, the city clerk's office is always here to answer any questions. During the process, we've had people come into our office that were not technologically savvy or needed help and 
We were able to get those people situated and help them with their maps. We are always open to members of the public to call us up for any information uh, regarding the redistricting process. So if anybody has any additional questions, any follow-ups, please uh, get in touch with my office. Um, we have uh, you know, two staff members here, uh, Shane in the back and our assistant city clerk, Tom Schmitter as well, if anybody needs to get um, information on how to contact the city clerk's office. Um, but tonight is um, the council will be voting on the final map. This is just the chance to uh, get a hold of any last minute feedback um, for, for the, the maps. Thank you, and, and that is really what we're here tonight for, is kind of final feedback. All right, so um, back to the council. I think, I believe you've answered all the questions that were posed by the public. Um, council Member Rodriguez. <clears throat> Apologies to uh, those who signed up and spoke your amount of time and didn't interrupt our meeting. Um, as a council, we wanna respect every single voter's and uh, residents wishes to participate in our public process, which must be done in an orderly fashion um, in order to get everybody's feedback in. Uh, we have now had eight official meetings, eight official meetings on the redistricting process um, that has been posted by law to uh, our website um, and the appropriate notifications. I think there's always room for improvement on how we get those notifications out, but we're a large city of 187,000 and there's a constructive civil means of posting notifications to participate in the uh, several workshops that we've had. And um, I know uh, Dr. Navarro has been um, extremely helpful with any and all correspondence, walk-ins that have come in that have asked questions. And um, I'm really satisfied with the feedback that we have received. I think it's shaped uh, a great map for our future. Um, Oceanside is home to the largest Hispanic population in North County. As a Hispanic and uh, three Hispanics that serve on this council, uh, Hispanic voters are the largest voting block in the state of California. One of the largest voting blocks, uh, excuse me, California Hispanic voters are the largest Hispanic voting block uh, in the nation. And, um, and so you can rest assured that the uh, Hispanic vote is gonna be very important and we're gonna make sure that those communities of interest are together. But more importantly, there's laws and rules and guidelines that we have to follow, uh, which are all outlined online. And they were all gone over, uh, over the several hours of meetings that we've had. And so um, I would encourage the public to go on those websites and um, do the research. You can actually sign up on the City of Oceanside website by putting your email in, and you can be notified on any and all meetings, commission meetings, everything we have going down as a city so that you can participate uh, in these meetings in the future. So I would encourage you to please sign up and uh, get involved. We would love to have you here more often. Um, I like the direction um, that we've we've gone um, with respect to uh, some of the concerns about separating our mobile home communities, uh, which are subject to um, state, federal, and local uh, law, including 16B, uh, and the protection of um, property owner rights, land owner rights in our mobile home parks, as well as the mobile home owners or rent control in our mobile home parks. Um, when I ran for office, that was something I learned and um, I fully support and I've fought for, and I know Mayor Sanchez has, and I believe, I believe, I can't speak on their behalf, that everyone on this dais uh, fully supports our seniors, veterans, disabled that live in our mobile home parks that have rent control. We have to fight for that and we have to support it. It protects both the landowner and the uh, private property owners of the mobile home that sits on that land. And so I think it's important that we keep those communities a little bit spread in different districts so that you have representation because it requires three votes on any, to get anything done in the city. And so if we have everything crowded in one district, then that really dilutes, in my opinion, the vote of the mobile home community versus having um, an interest or a stake with each council member having those uh, you know, unique dynamics in their district. So 
I, um, I, I, like, I appreciate the suggestion on moving over a little bit more on Douglas to, to include the community across the street, but I, I think it would really dilute having representation in District 3 to support our mobile home community when you have uh, questions and concerns that come up. Um, but I really appreciate that feedback. I, I, I've heard you, and um, but from my perspective, I wanna make sure that anybody that gets elected in the future after me, they will be required to understand the needs of the mobile home community, and the more mobile homes we have in each district, the better for, for everybody. <clears throat> How much time do I have left? Uh, five minutes and 12 seconds. All right, I'll be quick. Um, So with that being said, I am on board. I want to hear my other colleagues, but I'm, I'm ready to make a motion. I just don't want to over, overstate anybody's uh, t uh, comments. I mean, I'd like to make a motion uh, to move forward on this, uh, this map on item 17 and to move forward on an ordinance to adjust uh, the boundaries. Second. Thank you. Councilmember Weiss? I, I was just going to say, I, it has been a lengthy process to get here tonight. Uh, as much as some people think that it has not been, um, I know the city clerk and the demographer have spent countless hours in public meetings going over these, not just here with us, but out in the community as well. So I think there has been ample opportunity and notice uh, for people to participate if they so chose to participate, obviously some of them did not, and I'm comfortable with moving forward with uh, MAPC. Thank you, Deputy Mayor Kai. Yeah, I, I wanna just take a second to uh, thank City Clerk Navarro, Assistant City Clerk Schmitter, and the rest of the staff. They, they have done a phenomenal job. I think sometimes all their hard work is overlooked, but this has been a very extensive process. Um, I know how seriously their office has taken it, and we appreciate it, and um, thank you for all your hard work. Uh, Councilmember Jensen. I too would like to thank Dr. Navarro and the demographer that's on the line. There was a, a lot of meetings and a lot of work went into this. And um, I agree with Christopher Rodriguez that keeping the mobile home parks a little in each district gives you a voice in all the districts. And like he said, you, it takes three votes, so it gives you more strength that way. And uh, with that, I, I don't think the, the demographics change that much in District 1. I think they're, they're pretty solid. It is the most um, diverse district, and I think we kept it that way. And with that, I would like to move forward with this map as well. Thank you. Um, at the last uh, hearing, which was the last council meeting, um, I actually was hoping uh, to be able to support map A or B, um, actually specifically to try to maintain um, the Latino, especially the uh, communities of color, uh, Latino populations, had it just slightly more in A and B. I think I was um, supporting B, it's my recollection. Um, C uh, dilutes, but it's like a very small amount. I think it's 1%. Um, so, um, I think that um, my concern was that it this this map actually also uh, dilutes Rancho de Oro, which is one uh, community of interest. Um, Rancho de Oro, uh, I think we could have done a better job in keeping all of Rancho de Oro together, uh, but it is you know I was outvoted last time on a four to one. Um, this, this, is, uh, this is a map, this is for the next 10 years until the next census, um, which I, I believe will be changing, Oceanside will be changing a lot within, within the next 10 years, um, but certainly this is gonna be um, us, it, this is going to serve us um, and serve us well. Council Member Weiss. I just want to clarify, I believe all of Rancho Deloro is still within four, it's a portion of Ivy Ranch that was separated out. Which I believe they consider themselves part of that community. Uh, Deputy Mayor Kime. I'd, I'd also like to reiterate the fact that we all made a conscious effort to keep um, some of our um, Hispanic neighborhoods together, Crown Heights and the East Side. So that was a concern for all of us. So 
I think that's um, not being recognized here. It's important, and uh, we all recognize that. So thank you. Uh, thank you, Deputy Mayor Kahn. Actually, there were other. There, there was a Latino neighborhood that I was trying to include um, that was in District B. I mean, in um, Map B, but unfortunately, um, as I said, it was a four to one, and I believe. Um, um, comments were, well, we're going to be uh, pretty much cutting into different neighborhoods anyway. This, this is, this way, this one um, tries to uh, um, address all questions. Okay, no other comments on the dais. Please vote. I need to introduce the ordinance, Mayor. Right. Thank you. This is the introduction of an ordinance of the City Council of the City of Oceanside, California, amending Chapter 2, Article 15 of the Oceanside City Code to amend the City Council District boundaries in accordance with the California Fair Maps Act. Please vote. Motion approved, 5 -0. Thank you. Do we have Mr. Bart Ziegler here? Okay, we're on to public communications on off agenda items, advanced request to speak. Um, I understand, Mr. Ziegler, that you thought that this was going to be on the six o'clock um, calendar, uh, excuse me, agenda, and uh, um, we, do, we normally actually call other items um, if we can at five o'clock, on the five o'clock um, portion. So, uh, I'm sorry that you were not able to, you did not understand that. I, I apologize that you were not able to be here. And I apologize for being uh, late. Not only was there traffic, but I had the times mixed right. up. But when you think about um, the, the nuclear waste stored on the beach, that's the most deadly poison on the planet for 100,000 or 200,000 years, I guess time has different significance. I'm, my name's Bart Ziegler. Oh, just a second. I somehow have uh, 10 minutes on. It's five. For advanced written requests to speak, the speakers get five minutes. You're five correct. Minutes. Yeah. <laughs> I thought I, I thought I hit the five or so. Okay. Thank you. I apologize. <laughs> five. Now you have three. You need glasses. They don't give me a five minute one on here for some reason. Oh, they don't? <laughs> no. <laughs> okay. I'll give you an extra couple of seconds. You can go ahead and start, Mr. Ziegler. Thank you, Mayor. And, and I want to thank um, uh, Council Member Weiss, and I, and I want to thank um, uh, Councilman Rodriguez, thank you, and, and, and uh, Mayor Sanchez, and Council Member uh, Jensen, as well as um, the Deputy Mayor Kime, I think, and, and the audience, and I recognize uh, Bob Hubbard over there and some other people, but thank you very much for for taking for taking your time to listen to my what I'm what I'm sharing with you is uh, is um, become more increasing risk as we see what happens across the globe that 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 nuclear waste and nuclear problems become much more of much gravitas uh, the highest potential of, of uh, damage and loss with it's actually being called uh, nuclear waste storage sites are. The new term is an environmental bomb. That notwithstanding, I have a revised uh, draft resolution that, that should be passed out to each of you, I guess. Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, so San Onofre Nuclear Generation Station is a, is a failed nuclear power plant located 15.6 miles north of Oceanside, approximately. Oh, I should introduce myself. So I'm, I'm Bart Ziegler. I have a PhD in community environmental medicine from UC Irvine. I started, I co-founded a, a nonprofit called Samuel Arts Foundation that does arts, science, and education. Um, we also have the privilege of advocating recently for uh, the San Onofre problem or San Onofre issue. And so that's what I'm going to address today. And thank you very much for your, for your time. Um, the Generating Station Songs is, is, is uh, it was shut down in 2013 by the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. Um, then it was shut down because of a failed steam generator. Uh, Southern California Edison is the majority owner of, of songs, and they're currently taking apart their facility, the decommissioning of songs. And, but, and inside that the process are 3.6 million pounds of the worst poison on the planet. So that made concern for uh, a lot of people in the community that it, that things are done 
as, as safely as possible. Um, Songs is located only 108 feet from the, the Pacific Ocean. It's one of the, it's beside, it's, it's less than 200 yards from the busiest transportation corridor on the West Coast with I-5 and the train station. And I, I, you probably know a lot about the facts, but I'll just say that there are pop, popular recreational areas and beaches and trestles. The waste is vulnerable to the natural disasters and coastal hazards such as climate change, rising sea levels, wildfires, landslides, and earthquakes. And recently there was a tsunami scare, a scare from, from that island, Tonga. Uh, people are concerned with its vulnerability to terrorism. And that's become a, a new topic of newspapers. Uh, due to these risks, the U.S. NRC, or the U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission, a federal agency, has defined a 50-mile emergency evacuation zone around the San Onofre waste site. That means that if there's, an, if there's a leak or an explosion or any sort of calamity there, everyone in this zone will have to leave their homes and relocate. Oceanside community and all of its residents are part of this zone. Is a residence within the 50, is that a minute? Uh, yes. I have one minute? Okay, so residents should be aware of the adverse environmental and public health impacts. The safety and concerns exist with the waste storage. The thin walled steel containers have a warranty of only 25 years and they're vulnerable to gouging, corrosion, cracking, degradation. These issues highlight the urgency for increased oversight, more robust safety precautions, and safer storage solutions away from the coastline. A natural disaster could destroy residential property values, a catastrophe could damage Oceanside City revenue stream and affect funding. From a health physics point of view, nuclear waste is the most dangerous poison on the planet. This is a real community issue and the potential of radiation exposure to Southern California is too important to ignore. And necessary, it's necessary to ensure that this Nuclear waste is, is safely contained. We want to keep the coastline functional, our economy protected, and our community safe. Um, what I'll also pass out, if you don't mind, for the, count, for the council is a, a could flyer. You, that, could you wrap up your comments? Yes. A flyer, it, it's, it's in English on one side and Spanish on the other side in, in, in respect for the uh, community here. And it's basically time is not on our side, worst possible storage location. People have lost trust in Edison's management, potential for radiation exposure. So I'll leave this with, the, with thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we're, do you want to speak before the adjournment? I'll speak as a part of the council comments. Okay, okay. So we're at the end of the uh, meeting. Um, uh, are there any comments by, I, I guess it's not on here. Or here it is, general council member comments. Council member Rodriguez. <clears throat> Thank you, doctor, for uh, bringing this up and the speakers who uh, came to speak on this item. Um, with respect to nuclear power, uh, which is uh, relatively, for the most part, safe and effective, um, it is, uh, net neutral on GHG creation and um, is something that as technology and safety protocols advance is something that I think we would we have to embrace in order to uh, really deal and take a huge hit out of uh, global warming and climate change. Um, but tonight we're not talking about that. We're talking about storage. And uh, I know as I'm walking through the communities, especially around San Clemente, uh, and knocking on doors and local, locally here, Oceanside is, a thir is the actual largest city in the 49th Congressional District, and I think we have a responsibility to uh, get behind uh, other jurisdictions in joining their efforts um, in joining the coalition, uh, as well as getting on board with a resolution uh, that asks for the, uh, the uh, nuclear waste to be moved off-site into a safer location. I think it would give our community, 
um, I, I think this is, this is about peace of mind. And um, this is about um, the voters we represent up here feeling safe and secure. And so I would like to give, ask staff to come back at our next council meeting, March 23rd, um, and to get with uh, the County of San Diego's resolution that was unanimously passed, as well as other jurisdictions. Uh, feel free to definitely take some of the recommendations from uh, the nice doctor that came in today and pr provided that feedback. But I would like to have a resolution in front of us uh, on the 23rd that we could uh, have public feedback on and, um, and hopefully unanimous, unanimously support uh, moving on this. Um, you know, the idea of radiation exposure to Southern California is too important to ignore. And um, I really support congressional efforts through Congressman Mike Levin or uh, after 2022, we'll see who's next, um, to really come to terms on a location that can uh, hold nuclear waste uh, from, from the rest of the United States, a secure location and, and a pathway to decommissioning uh, all, all the facilities that are aging out. Um, I know Diablo, Diablo Canyon, PG&E owns, is uh, unfortunately, Politicians are shutting it down early, in my opinion. It produces 10% of California's energy, and by shutting that down, it's putting pressure on jurisdictions like Oceanside and others to find additional ways to produce energy, which is a small part of the reason why your energy bill is going up. Um, as as uh, energy suppliers are unable to negotiate longer-term contracts, local jurisdictions are taking over to become your electric company in a sense, and um, when that bureaucracy gets involved, there's less security because the private investment sector is not involved in doing what they've been doing for so long, and so that has increased um, a lot of our electricity bill here locally. Who's, whose electricity bill has increased this past year? Anybody? I know mine has, okay. So we need, we need to be smart about this and smart about climate change. And, uh, but with this item, I would like to have staff bring that back and that uh, includes my time. Thank you, so this is not on a regular agenda, but we can give direction to staff and I agree with, council, with uh, council member Rodriguez's comments on this. So if, if staff can please bring back a resolution for us to um, review and adopt. Um, and I, I, I want to say that I did serve on and continue to serve on Congress Levin's song task force um, Which included an invitation to tour the site. I've toured a nuclear uh, Power plant as a member of a state agency in addition. I'm regularly briefed by Congressman Levin's staff um, with respect to the bi bipartisan spent f um, nuclear fuel solutions caucus um, which was which was actually created as a result of, of the task force uh, final report. Um, so this is something that is of great, great um, concern for all of us. Um, I, I'm, I'm in with respect to the legislation that they that they are moving forward on, which would prioritize sites with the highest potential for damage and loss, and that would be with respect to natural disasters, proximity of high populations, and concerns regarding national security. We hit all three of them. Um, it is a long list of uh, uh, nuclear power plants that have been shut down and that have spent fuel. Um, Oceans, uh, excuse me, Oceanside songs would rise to the top of the list. So that is very critical legislation that um, will, uh, whoever's gonna be representing us here um, in the 49th, it's very critical that this, that, that this be done as, as soon as possible. Um, I understand that they still need legislation to even talk about an intermediate um, location that right now you, you just have a, a final location um, and that timing is, is, is really attached to first identifying that, that location. Um, Council Member Weiss. Thank you, I agree with both the mayor and uh, Council Member Rodriguez and uh, want to issue my support for the a resolution that will support the Action for Spent Fuel Solutions Now campaign. Uh, and I believe we had uh, sample resolutions that came from that and I, I do want to acknowledge that uh, you know, there was bipartisan support with uh, Congressman Levin's uh, efforts and uh, the mayor and uh, former council member Jerry Kern were part of that as well. So uh, I look forward to uh, hopefully having a, a unanimous vote on that resolution when it comes forward. Councilmember Jensen. 
Yes, I would like to um, take this opportunity to remind everybody that the school choice um, petition still can be signed at californiaschoolchoice.org. It's really important that we get school choice on the ballot and let every parent have an equal opportunity for their children's education. Um, and remind everybody that Monday the 14th, right here at our Regal Plaza, that we are hosting the movie Whose Children Are They? And there will be a tent set up by Knockout Pizza, and we just hope everybody will come down and participate in that as well. And you'll be able to sign the petition there as well. Thank you. Thank you. No other requests to speak. I just want to um, wish everybody happy St. Patrick's Day, uh, a, week, a week from tomorrow, which would be the 17th. Um, and I, I'd like to um, take this time to uh, uh, let everyone know that Karen Godinay, uh, uh, from, of the Godinay family, that really gives a lot to the city of Oceanside, their whole family has um, for many, many years. Um, her uh, celebration of life is on Tuesday the 15th um, at uh, 1 o'clock. And uh, just want to say I, I was able to work with her um, she worked with the Boys and Girls Club, um, with the, the with the Samoan Cultural Celebration. Just a really big heart and really hardworking. Um, she will be joining their sibling, um, older sibling, Joe Joseph, as well as their parents. I mean, she will be joining them, and um, um, just you know, just a really great person. So if we could adjourn um, in memory. Um, of Karen. I'd really appreciate it. Thank you. This meeting is adjourned until next Wednesday, March 16th, 2 p.m., for planning commission appointments. Thank you.